cover in a pretty short time span here. I'm going to try to get y'all back out the front door around 10.30 so you have time to get down to Buckrow Beach. So we're going to go through stuff pretty quickly. Uh, the idea is that we're going to do the workshop in here first and then we'll go through the galleries since this is the focus. Uh, we're going to spend whatever time is necessary on this part of the program and then we may end up just doing a walkthrough of the galleries. Um, we'll still talk about some of the highlights in there, but this is going to be our focus today. And this is kind of a pilot program. Uh, I'm Chris Peters. I'm in charge of the museum's educational programming. And that means that I design this kind of stuff. So this is a pilot for me. Uh, we've had enough people with an interest in the arrival of the first Africans in 1619 that it makes sense at this point to start building a workshop around it so that I can dive into some details. Uh, talking about it in the galleries, we can end up staying in one spot for half an hour. So changing and moving that in here lets us focus on other things in the museum and dive into the details here. And we've got more to work with here than I would in the gallery. So it's kind of a pilot program. Y'all are my guinea pigs this morning. Um, so there's going to be some things that may not go right. This is a test run, uh, including the technology. We're actually in the process of updating this room. Yep, neither of them are working yet. Um, literally Monday morning, we're going to have two giant TVs installed on this wall. And I never have to deal with this pop-up screen again. So we're in the last use of this today. Uh, but it means that not all of the tech is working the way it's supposed to since we're getting new stuff installed in a couple of days. So I'm going to have to keep walking over and pushing a button on the computer. But um, so our focus is going to be on the arrival of the first Africans in 1619. Uh, these are by no means the first Africans to come to North America. The first Africans that arrived here came with Columbus uh, right at the very beginning of European exploration. So. You know, it's been over a hundred years at this point. These are the first Africans that we can document coming to English North America. That's the important thing to keep in mind here. The other important thing is the way that this story has changed over time. It all goes back to a letter from a guy named John Rolfe. Anybody that's read anything about Jamestown or has visited almost any historic site in Virginia, has heard that name before. He's the man that brought tobacco to Virginia. He was also the treasurer of the colony. Or I'm sorry, not the treasurer, the king merchant. He was responsible for all of the goods coming in and out of Virginia for the Virginia Company at one point. So he's sending a lot of correspondence back and forth with the company in England, and he's the reason we even know about this event. For a long time, it was believed that these first Africans to come here had actually come from the Caribbean that they were people who had been enslaved generationally in the Caribbean, and that they were captured by the English or bought by the English and brought up here to Virginia. We know now that that was not true. And this is one of the big things that's really changed in our understanding of this topic. Uh, and that's what we're going to go through step by step here in just a moment. So title of this program and a phrase that you're going to hear a lot if you read anything about this is 20 and odd. And I've chosen that name for a specific reason, but I'm not going to tell you until the end. So we'll come back around to that. And this is about the first Africans coming to English North America. Here we go. All right, so our story really begins in Portuguese controlled uh, Luanda, Angola. This is a map of Western Central Africa uh, during the Portuguese colonial period. And I say the colonial period. This was an area that Portugal controlled until the 1960s. So the beginning of the colonial period for Portugal. Uh, what we're looking at here is the Kingdom of Congo up at the top here. The largest and most stable political entity in Western Central Africa at the time. Below that are a bunch of smaller kingdoms, including two, one called Ingola, the other called Benguela, that were taken over by the Portuguese. So Portugal established itself in the area in 1575. That was when they actually took over a small spot right on the coast and founded the city of Luanda. So 1575 is when all of this begins, even though it comes to Virginia in 1619. 
1575, the Portuguese are putting down roots in this part of Africa. That city of Luanda is right here on the coast. It is a port city. Uh, it's got a, a cove and a little spit of land that they can put fortifications on to protect it. And then it also has a huge river flowing out into the Atlantic Ocean right there. And that is the Kwanzaa River. So that river allows access to the interior. Very important if you're trying to control the region and set up trade networks. So the Portuguese are there establishing themselves at Luanda. They go further south and they take over the kingdom, the entire kingdom of Benguela. So now it's the Portuguese colony of Angola and the Portuguese colony of Benguela. They were those territories that you see outlined there in pink and yellow, those were controlled by Portugal entirely by the 1610s. So in a matter of about 30 years, they went from having this tiny little foothold to controlling thousands and thousands of square miles, uh, taking over what is effectively two kingdoms. Now the way that they're able to do this isn't just that they have really good technology and they've got a lot of experience fighting, it also has to do with the political situation in this part of the world at the time. These smaller territories that you see are individual kingdoms, many of which are in competition with each other. The Portuguese come in and they exploit the ongoing conflict of the region and use it to their advantage. This really comes down to the political structure of the region as a whole, not just these kingdoms, but the way that power was held by the people in charge. Uh, it's very much like feudal Europe. You've got the kings up there at the top. They make some laws and they have overall rule of a territory, but they don't control the everyday function. That falls to a class of nobility, just like in Europe. The noblemen in this region are called sobas. Each soba is like an English earl. They have a fixed territory that they're responsible for governing, and they answer to the king if they like the king. If they don't like the king, their allegiances can shift, and that's one of the things that the Portuguese are going to exploit. So they will find sobas that are not happy with their kings, and they will offer them aid, military aid, big part of that, but also food, trade goods, consumer items, stuff that they would like to get their hands on and can support their region, especially food. Anytime you're dealing with moving food around, that's actually a really big incentive for people to cooperate with you. Uh, an army marches on its stomach and so does any population. Their daily functions come down to whether they're fed or not. So the relationships that the Portuguese are building with these individual sobas are going to start to change the political dynamic of the region leads to some new conflicts that had not existed, it enforces older ones, and it brings these two larger territories on the coast under Portuguese control. The wild card for the Portuguese, the thing that they didn't know they would be able to use when they arrived, were roving bands of mercenaries. So on the map there are two spots right up here directly above me, I can't reach it, it says Hagas, J-A-G-G-A-S, uh, and down here we see the word again. The Portuguese use this term, Hagas, Wagas, to describe a people that don't really have a territory of their own. They are roving raiders, effectively. And according to every source we have from the time period, now keep in mind, these sources are from their victims, but from every source that we have in the time period, these Pagas, who actually go by the, the name Imbangala, that's the, the title they use for themselves, at least in the southern group. The northern ones, we know almost nothing about. They're separate entities. It's not one big group. But the southern ones call themselves the Imbangala, and according to every source we have, it is a cult. It is a religious cult that worships evil. Uh, in European terms, they're worshiping the devil. In more local terms, they are worshiping any of the local deities that could be considered bad. Uh, they do not allow children to be born in their group. If a child is born, they will kill it. They only recruit new people through bringing them in from the outside. That is the only way they refresh their numbers. They rely on constant conflict 
to get food and shelter, and they just rove through this entire big area. That's why there's such a huge swath right there that falls under their control. They're not actually controlling it. They're exploiting it for everything that it has, and they're moving from town to town, taking everything they can. People flee in their path. Everybody that can gets away from them and joins one of these other tribes or the Portuguese colonies. They need help. They need protection from this roving band of raiders. Portuguese have no idea that these people are going to pop up when they start this, this project of theirs to build up a territory. However, they can use it to their advantage. Now they're not just using the Solas, these individual noblemen, they're also allying themselves with the Mbangala and giving them weapons, giving them food. That's part of why they rove everywhere. They're stealing every bit of food they can. Uh, they also want alcohol. They will cut down every palm tree. Palm wine was a big product that came out of this region. To get palm wine, you would tap the tree, just like you tap a maple tree. You'd drive a little thing into the side and, and let the sap run out. And then you would uh, allow it to ferment, turn into wine. That takes too much time for them. They cut the tree down, they let it sit on the ground for a couple of months, and then once the stuff is fermented inside the tree, they tap it and start drawing straight wine out of the trees that they've cut down. It means that they're clear-cutting entire parts of this region to do this. So again, these accounts, and all of them agree on these details, I mean, none of this is in conflict. These people are being referred to us by their enemies. So we have to keep that in mind, but this is pretty brutal stuff, yes? Which reminds me, what is the source of the data that you're quoting about? Uh, there's a number of sources, um, Portuguese colonial records, um, stuff from the Kingdom of Congo, which today is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. Some of that is in Portuguese, some of it is in French, some of it is in Italian, some of it is in native African languages. Some of it comes from the people of Angola today, who are, in some cases, descendants of the Mbangal. Um, they end up setting down roots eventually after they've rampaged up and down this territory They finally need to stop that because they're running out of room to move and they're Encountering actual militaries that can stop them So they stop this roving and they settle in the territory that we're about to talk about So they end up settling in this region at the end of all their campaigns that last about 30 or 40 years total uh, Maybe well close to 50 years by the time they're done. So just a couple of decades after what we're talking about, they give up this, this lifestyle and they start to settle down in part of the territory that we're going to cover. And so when you say they were devil worshippers, whose view of them was that? Was that the everybody. European? I mean, that, every, no, everybody being the Europeans? No, everybody. Everybody that's, that's, that they're attacking. I mean, any of the, the Sobas that are encountering them, any of the people here, uh, this is universally described by everybody that's involved in this region. Most of what we have available to us in English today is translated from Portuguese, but the people that were doing the translating were looking at all the African accounts as well, and they're all saying the same thing. So this is one of those cases, just like if you look at Jamestown, you will not find a single kind word written anywhere about John Radcliffe. The man was universally hated by everybody in Jamestown, Everybody was saying the same things, and that's the case here as well. It's just one of those cases where all of the sources that are available today in every language from this region, they're all saying the same thing. So I think that we can we can take some of this at face value. Maybe they are making them a little bit meaner sounding uh, because that accounts for why they're all getting displaced, but it does cause huge upheaval to the region. Uh, the, that territory was multiple kingdoms before the Mbangala moved in and drove everybody out. So this is a huge upheaval to the region, and they're just laying waste to everything and leaving nothing behind. So it's a really big upset to this territory, and the Portuguese are able to use that to their advantage. If you're trying to take control of a region, you will use any destabilizing uh, effect you can, and that's going to be a pretty useful one. Uh, we also, we actually have a description of all of this from an English source as well. There was an Englishman named Andrew Battel who ended up getting captured by the Portuguese and forced into uh, being a military, uh, what should we, a military advisor for the Mbangala. He's actually, he, he was a military officer for the English. He was captured and forced to go into this territory and work with the Mbangala for the Portuguese colonial government. And he actually told this story 
to a man named Samuel Purchas back in England. So there's even an English account of this, although most of the documents that we have from this territory in this time period are going to be Portuguese. But like I say, every source on this topic agrees on those details. So those Kagas, those in Bengala, are going to be a really important fighting force for the Portuguese as they try to destabilize everything. I can't get the mouse to work. That's because we don't have the antenna. Ah, that would probably do it. Now it's going to auto sync. Um, so by the 1610s, the Portuguese can control both of those territories. Thank you, sir. Have full control over those two territories. They're using the Mbangala to destabilize the kingdoms of Nadongo, which is right here, and the kingdom of Matamba. This is where we really dive into our story, because this is where we think the people that came to Virginia were from. So you've got this ongoing regional conflict with the Portuguese trying to expand using the Mbangala. They basically got Matamba and Nadongo surrounded at this point. And they are causing these people to get uprooted from their homes, their farms, their villages, their cities. Uh, many of these areas are urbanized. Uh, some of these cities rival European cities. The capital of Nadongo, Cabasa, has a population of nearly 50,000 people in one city. So, I mean, this is, this is a major metropolitan area. A lot of trade is going on in the region. And all of that's being disrupted. So the people that are being displaced have nowhere to go. In many cases, they're being captured by the Mbangala or by the Portuguese or by the Kingdom of Congo. They don't necessarily want their borders being overrun and they're enslaving these people and selling them on the African slave market. So all of these displaced people are being gobbled up. They're being sold to the Portuguese and the Spanish or being moved further inland to other kingdoms. Most of them are ending up on the slave market in one way or another. So that brings us into our next thing. So, and I'm actually going to, took a long time to get the video to load earlier, so I'm going to exit out of this and go to the video that I already got loaded. That will save us some time. All right, we'll come back to that in a moment. First, we're going to talk about some of the reproductions that I have here. What is that? Mm, axe. An axe, a hatchet. Yeah, this is a this is an axe that would be of the style from Western Central Africa. So it's made out of iron and steel, and uh, iron working has been going on in Africa just as long, or perhaps even longer, than in Europe. There's a lot of debate amongst anthropologists as to where ironworking actually began. It was either in this part of the world, Western Central Africa, or it was in Southern Europe. And there's a lot of evidence that kicks it back and forth. But it goes back to about uh, 2,500 years ago. Or I'm sorry, 3,500 years ago. So this is, this is a pretty old technology. It's been used in that part of the world for a long time. The issue is there's not a whole lot of coal. There's not a whole lot of hardwood that can be turned into charcoal, and there's not a whole lot of iron ore deposits. They know how to do it. They don't necessarily have the materials. And that means they have to be very uh, thoughtful about how they make their tools. So you get this very slender axe blade. This thing is quite thin. It's very effective, but you're going to have trouble putting together larger weapons like a sword or large spearheads or larger axes. Most of the axes, even larger ones, still maintain the same shape because it uses the smallest amount of material possible. When you don't have a whole lot of the iron or the fuel to heat it up, you have to be very, very careful about how you do that work. You have to be very efficient. This is going to be the main weapon that people in the region have. There are some swords or what we might call machetes. They're usually pretty short, maybe about two feet long at most, not like a European rapier that can be three and a half or four feet long. So they do have swords. Those are usually going to be in the hands of the nobility or wealthier members of the society. They do have some spears, um, but this is going to be by far the most common weapon. And so when you're up against people who have swords, who have pikes, who have firearms, you're going to be very heavily outarmed. 
And this is going to be one of those weapons that the Portuguese are bringing to the area in large quantities and are using as a trade item. And more importantly, not just the firearms, but the gunpowder too. This thing is useless if you don't have any gunpowder to put in it. So the Portuguese are making money off of that, raising allies, especially amongst the Mbangala now, and they are rampaging through the area. That axe isn't just being undone by the weapons that are available. It's also going to be undone by the armor. So a typical European infantryman isn't actually armed with a gun. Most of the infantry in Europe at the time are armed with this. This is a pike. And this is actually a half pike. A full pike would be 16 to 18 feet long. So I couldn't even hold it up right in this room. Our ceiling is about 18 feet high. So I would be scraping the ceiling with a full size one. Now, it's a very unwieldy weapon. You can't go out on the battlefield and use this against one person. That's not the way this is meant to be done. Instead, this is what we call a unit weapon. You have to have a bunch of guys armed with these things. And the way this works is that they go out on the battlefield together and the other men in the formation are going to be standing right here next to me and in front of me, behind me. There's going to be a guy behind me with an 18 foot long spear. You can have four or five men behind you who also have their pikes going in front of your face. Now, as you engage the enemy, you have your hand on the back here, you've got the other one tucked up underneath your arm, and that means this arm has room to move. So now you take that hand and you push it. This is how you attack with this weapon. So a block of men, and we could be talking a unit that might have close to a thousand men in one block, are going to march across the field together until they get to the enemy when they will bring their pikes down and start using them together against another formation. Now that's how it's done in Europe. If you're not wearing any armor, you're going to get killed almost immediately. And because of that, everybody on the battlefield had one type of armor or another. The most basic thing would be a leather buff coat like this one. So this is the bare minimum that you might have for armor. And some of them have buttons, some of them have hooks like this one. So there's a bunch of little hooks right here. Some of them had to be laced up. But one way or another you have this heavy leather buff coat that you're going to be wearing. And then over that, if you have the ability, you will also have plate armor. Male, like what you'd see in a medieval movie, has mostly fallen out of use by this time period. However, plate armor has not. So, you have a back plate, fits around your back, and then you have a breast plate or a cuirass that goes over your chest. And I don't know the terms in Portuguese, I know what they are in English, which is actually French. The English use French terms for their armor. But you now have a breastplate, a backplate, and you often have a helmet. This offers a lot of protection to your body. Not going to stop a bullet, but it will certainly stop a pike. It will certainly stop an axe. So even if somebody comes running at you full speed and takes a full arm swing at you with this thing, it's hardly going to dent the armor. This stuff is really good protection. And this is what really aids the Portuguese. Yeah, the firearms are useful, they take a while to reload. The swords are useful, they don't have that much reach. However, if you have a band of men who are attacking you in loose formation with axes, and you've got a couple hundred guys in a single block with plate armor and pikes, there's nothing you can do against them except run up against the spears. So no matter where they're fighting, the Portuguese are going to dominate, and they're starting to give this stuff, maybe not these, the Mbangala and the other local tribes and kingdoms, they're not going to understand this type of warfare. Uh, it requires way too much um, discipline. European soldiers know they're going to die. Like They go into a battle accepting that they're already dead. And there's going to be huge casualties. Most people are not willing to accept that. Unit tactics rely on accepting a high casualty rate. Most, most organizations 
won't do that. So they're giving armor to their allies, they're giving firearms to their allies, probably no pikes, um, maybe some swords, but this is what's really giving them their advantage in the area, the technology that they bring and the alliances that they are able to make. And I could spend a half an hour trying to describe exactly how this works, but it's a lot easier to show you in a film. So, this is a scene, and yes, that's Vigo Mortensen right there. This is actually a Spanish film. He speaks fluent Spanish. I learned that when I started doing research into this film. But, um, you can see all the pikemen standing behind them, all those pikes. That's the formation of pikemen that moves across the battlefield together. The musketeers are in front. You'll notice they're not wearing armor. They're not expected to fight hand to hand. Some of them may have leather coats, but that's about it. And some of this is superfluous. Alright, cavalry, there's the musketeers. So the musketeers, because it takes about 30 seconds to reload the gun, they take turns. They fire, and then they take their weapons, they walk to the back of the formation where they reload. The next guy step up and fire, they go to the back to reload. Alright, cavalry, not important to us. Pikemen, when they're all standing shoulder to shoulder, not even cavalry can break through. And this is actually the original purpose of pikes to stop men on horseback. This comes out of medieval Europe. So a block of pikemen, you can't get close enough to them to do any real damage. And you can see the helmets that they're wearing, that offers a lot of protection as well. Um, the men on horseback are wearing helmets like this, which is a Bergenet. Uh, some of the men on foot are going to be wearing cabasets, which is basically the same helmet if you take off the cheek flaps. So there we go. They march together as a unit. All of those pikes level at the enemy at the same time, and then they have to come point to point with each other. Very high casualty rates. European countries were willing to accept this. So, you know, this is, fighting is always a nasty business. Uh, European warfare is especially so. So, those Those tactics are being used by the Portuguese in the region to garner all of the slaves that they are sending to the New World. So in this region, a lot of these people are going to be transferred, transported on the water. They're going to be put on boats. Those that don't get put on boats and brought down the Kwanzaa River or the Lukala River or the others in the region are going to be marched across land. And you can see these gentlemen have shorter pikes, half pikes like this one. So they're also not wearing armor. Um, they're probably Portuguese. And then they're going to march people down to the coastline. And this is done all over the region. The Kingdom of Congo is engaged in the slave trade. Uh, any of the other kingdoms surrounding the area. We don't really know what the involvement of the Kingdom of Ndongo or Matamba actually was in the slave trade. There's so much turmoil that that kind of falls through the cracks. But they would have engaged in it as well. So this is how people are brought to the coast or further inland to kingdoms that weren't even on the map that we started with. Uh, and then for the Portuguese, they're put on the ships like this one. Now this is not a reproduction of a slave galleon. This is just a Spanish galleon. Uh, but this is a modern reproduction. That's a full-sized actual sailing ship that's operated by the Spanish government. It spends a lot of its time on the east coast of the United States. So if you go into, especially St. Augustine, Florida, which is where they spend a lot of their time, you may actually see that ship. So that's a full-size reproduction. I've got it up here because it is very close in size and very similar in design to the San Juan Bautista or St. John the Baptist, which is the ship that we know carried these first Africans across the Atlantic Ocean. So, here's where we're at at this point. Political turmoil in the region is leading to a huge capturing of slaves who are effectively prisoners of war, who are being sold to the Spanish and the Portuguese. They're being brought down to the coast and put on ships like that one to be brought across to the Americas. 
Most of them, since this is a Portuguese territory, are going to Portuguese colonies like Brazil. However, Portugal and Spain are close allies. A lot of them are going to Spanish colonies as well. The biggest one being Mexico. Mexico has the largest population, it's got the most gold mines, it's got the most plantations. That's where the bulk of everything in Spanish America is going or coming from. So we believe that this ship was on its way to Veracruz, Mexico. And so they loaded the ship up sometime in the spring of 1619, we don't know exactly when, with somewhere around 350 people who've been enslaved during all of this conflict that's going on in the region. And they're going to be sailing all the way to the Americas. So, sorry the map is kind of fuzzy. There aren't really good maps of this yet, so I'm having to use whatever I can find. Um, so you're not going to be able to read hardly any of it, but this right here is the region that was highlighted on the first map. So there's the port city of Luanda. That green line is a good approximation for the route that San Juan Bautista would have traveled. From here to Veracruz, Mexico is about 8,500 miles. And these ships travel at about two to two and a half miles per hour on average. It takes four or five months to cross the ocean on that green line. This is not a fast way to travel which also helps explain part of the very high mortality rate that accompanied what we call the Middle Passage, going from the first part of the passage is what's happening back here. That's the first part of the passage. The Middle Passage is getting across the Atlantic Ocean, and the final part of that passage is going to be where you ended up at market in the New World. So the Middle Passage is accompanied by a lot of mortality because you've got a lot of people packed into those ships. There's going to be disease. There's going to be really hot conditions, just the heat can undo some of these people and cause them to die. Um, there's not a whole lot of food, so food is scarce. Uh, very, very disgusting and horrific way to cross the Atlantic Ocean. And we don't even know the details of how they did it. Uh, one of the most famous images that we have of a European slave ship is from after the American Revolution, 1780s. And that ship has all of the slaves laid out in very neat rows down inside the ship. There's actually, we'll call them shelves built for these people to lay on. We don't know if that's the normal practice at this point yet. Uh, there's a lot that we don't actually know about the transatlantic slave trade in this time period. So we can say with some certainty that it's going to be absolutely horrific, but we don't know exactly how they got into the details of fitting all these people. So, here's where things get kind of weird. Everything that I've described so far is normal. It's what these people are used to. This is what they expect. Uh, none of that was out of the ordinary. This is where things start to get weird on us. Where those two lines up there convert, the green line and the red line, there were two English privateers in the Caribbean. Now, privateers have no interest in a slave ship. That's not why they're in the Caribbean. They, they're not going to make money off of that. They have no interest. What they're actually after are Spanish treasure galleons. The gold, silver, and gems that the Spanish were stealing from the Aztec, the Inca, and the Maya for several hundred years, at this point now, or over a hundred anyway, that gets packed into large cargo ships and sent back to Spain once a year, every summer. So the ship left from Africa in the spring and spent four or five months getting to the Bay of Campeche up there. They're in the right place at the right time. Every large port in Spanish America collected the gold together, put it on a ship, and then that ship did not sail to Spain immediately. It went to Havana. All of these ships from independent colonies are going to come together at Havana, Cuba, and then they sail as a fleet back to Spain. That way they can protect themselves. One ship is powerful, a bunch of ships is more powerful. So the English can't attack. No English fleet ever attacked an entire treasure fleet. Uh, never, never happened. The English knew better. They just could not capture ships that way. So they know better than to try to attack the fleet after it leaves Havana. 
they've got to find a ship on its own sailing from a port city to Havana. San Juan Baptista is in the right place, at the right size, at the right time. The problem is they're headed into Mexico, not out. So the English see the ship, they say, okay, there's our target. They chase it down, fighting ensues. When they capture the ship, there's no gold, there's no silver. And an important part of the plan for the English, they sail from England all the way across. A voyage that can take two to three months. It's a distance of about 5,000 miles. And by the time they get across, by the time anybody gets across, they are very low on food, water, and other supplies. So... <laughs> Just to make things more interesting. That's okay, we'll be done by the time we get this. So So by the time the English get to the Caribbean, they're running low on food. They are relying on capturing a ship that's not just full of gold and silver, but also food and water that they can then use to make their return trip home. Well, they capture a ship that's been at sea for four or five months already. There is no food or water. They're on their last couple of barrels of water to make it the rest of the way to Mexico. And there's no gold or silver. So now they've got a problem. They cannot return back to England because they don't have enough supplies to do it. They're going to lose all of the money that they've put into this venture. And this is expensive. Sending a ship full of several hundred men across the Atlantic Ocean who are armed to the teeth with the same weapons that we've already looked at, and especially a lot of these when you're fighting on a ship, uh, that's very expensive. So they cannot go back empty-handed. They can't go back at all. They have to get supplies to make their return trip come they're running into a secondary problem here. They've just announced their presence. Everybody knows that this happens. It's not like there's just one ship out there. They don't encounter the San Juan Bautista on its own in the vast Caribbean. There are other smaller ships nearby who can see what's going on. Now, granted, as soon as they see this, they're going to scurry the other way because they don't want to get attacked by the English too. But anybody that sees this conflict going on or has spotted the English at all. They'll know the difference between an English and a Spanish ship. They go into the nearest port and say, guys, the English are here. The English are here. Don't send your ships out. They attack this ship. They capture it. No other ships are going to leave port while they're still in the area. So they don't even have the option to try again. They've blown their only opportunity this year to capture a treasure galley. So they're in pretty dire straits at this point. They don't have the supplies to sail back to England. They are going to lose all the money that was invested in this venture. This is a bad day for everybody. So they do the only thing that they can really think of. They take about 60 of the Africans out of the ship. They split them between the two English privateers. And then they sail to the nearest English port. That would be us. Now, the fight at sea would have been pretty nasty. Here's a pikeman and a musketeer. They're using the same weapons on board ship that they are using on land. The tactics are going to be a little bit different. Uh, when the two ships get close enough, they're going to start with some of these. That's a hand grenade. So they were calling them that 400 years ago. That name is already in use. A uh, hollow cast iron ball that's full of gunpowder. And, of course, theirs wouldn't have a hole in the bottom. But hollow cast iron ball filled with gunpowder. You light the fuse, you throw it onto the deck of the enemy ship, and then you crouch down on the, behind the railing of yours, and that clears a path for you. Men pop up from behind the railing. They fire their weapons, and then they crouch back down so that they can reload. As people try to come across from one ship to the other, while he's reloading, there are pikemen standing on the deck waiting for that guy to come walking across a board. That's the only way you get from one ship to the other. And so they don't have to be in close formation anymore. This thing can be used when you're trying to get somebody off of a plank, off of a board. And so the tactics are going to be pretty, pretty nasty, just like on land. And they're wearing armor. So if you fall off the ship, you're going to go straight to the bottom pretty quick. So everything about fighting at sea is just as dangerous about fighting on land 
And the image on the left is an artist rendition uh, from a few years ago of the battle that took place between the White Lion, the Treasurer, and the San Juan Bautista. So this is an actual rendition of the event that we are talking about, modern. Uh, but the two English ships are considerably smaller, however they have better technology on board, and a lot more men. A Portuguese or Spanish slave ship or trade ship is going to have a couple dozen men on board at most. Each of those English ships is going to have somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 to 200 men on board. So the Spanish are vastly outnumbered here. Uh, and you'd think the English would have figured out pretty quickly when there weren't that many people fighting that this ship probably wasn't worth having, but once the battle commences, you go to the end and see what happens. So pikemen and musketeers, just like the ones we saw in the video, are fighting on these ships as well. And that battle probably took uh, the better part of, of half a day um, to close the distance between the ships since none of them are moving that quickly. You're talking a couple miles per hour. It takes several hours just to bring the ships together. Then they're going to shoot their cannons at each other to tear up the sails and rigging. Then they've got to bring the ships together and tie them onto each other. So it's not a fast process. Once you get to the fighting, that part will actually go pretty quickly. But men using these same weapons that we looked at before fighting on ships instead of on land. Now here's another modern rendition of the events that we're talking about. This one was done by an artist named Sidney King. Uh, if you go to any national park, especially in Virginia, you're going to see a lot of his work in the 1950s. The National Park Service went through a, an entire series of modern artwork depicting things that they were talking about at their sites. And so there's quite a few that are related to Virginia and Jamestown. So this was done about 60 or 70 years ago by a man named Sidney King. And here we have those Angolans, the Nadongans, and Matongans that had come to Virginia. Now when this was done, they had no idea where these people were from. If we think back to the very beginning, I said at the, at the beginning of this topic, that everybody thought that they were from the Caribbean, that they had been enslaved for generations down there, and that the English got them and brought them up. We now know all of the events that transpired from beginning in Western Central Africa to the voyage across the Atlantic Ocean. We know the name of the ship. We know the name of the two English ships that attacked it. We know what happened with them. We know that they brought them to Virginia. We even know the political intrigue that accompanied this. And we don't have time to delve into that, but one of these ships, the White Lion and the Treasure, the White Lion had a legal document that allowed them to capture Spanish ships. It came from Holland, from the uh, from Vlissingen, or as the English call it, Flushing, Holland. And a letter of mark is what a privateer gets from a country that's at war with somebody. So Holland is fighting against the Spanish, these English ships go to Holland, get a letter of mark that says, I'm a naval contractor. I will attack the enemies of your nation under your flag, and I get to keep some of the proceeds that come out of this. That's how privateering worked. The treasurer had a letter of mark that had been invalidated because the country that they got it from signed a peace treaty about a month after they got the letter of mark with Spain. So now they've just committed an act of piracy. When they show up in Virginia, they are turned away. And not just that, the ship is partly owned by the governor of Virginia, Samuel Argyll, who has fallen out of favor with the king. So Samuel Argyll had just been recalled to England when these ships arrived. So the treasurer comes into Virginia thinking they're going to meet up with one of the major stockholders in their venture, and instead they encounter a different government, one that's not going to like them. Uh, there were different factions battling in England over control of the Virginia Company, and the treasurer's on the wrong side of the argument. So even the details that come out of this political intrigue, all of this infighting at the English court, we know that. There are still a lot of questions that we don't know, and that's going to be part of, of the end of this, is what we do and don't know. So what I've just described to you, what we've just spent the last 35 minutes talking about, is a breakdown of what we actually do know. All of that is verified. All of it comes out of the historic record. Uh, it took 20 years to piece this together. It all started with a paper written by a historian named Engel Sluder. 
And he's the one that figured out that these Africans did not come from the Caribbean, that they came from this ship, the San Juan Bautista. He figured out that they were attacked by two Dutch ships, not English, Dutch, in the research he had done, because they hold letters of mark from other countries, they're not working for the English government, and that they were brought up here. He figured out where they came from. San Juan Bautista was, uh, there's documents in Mexico from the ship landing. So we know where it started from, which was Luana. So all of that was pieced together in 1997 by one historian. Another fella named John Thornton, who works at Brown University, went further. He is an expert on mostly Central African cultures and history, although he does some other stuff as well, and especially Portuguese colonialism. So he read English Luther's article and said, huh, I know why. I know why these people were captured in Africa. And he laid it all out. And so it's taken a long time for all of this to get pieced together. Here we are, we now know that the ships were actually English. We know that one of them went to the Duke of Savoy. One of them went to Holland to get their letters of mark. We've been able to piece all of that together. We don't know what was going on in the kingdom of, kingdoms of Ndongo or Matamba. We don't know how much upheaval is going on. That's kind of a dark spot in this story. There's a lot of details that are missing there because a lot of the documentation is in Portuguese or it's from people that were living in the Portuguese territories. Even if it's in an African language, they were people that were living in Portuguese territory. And that's why those documents were preserved. So there's some, there's some questions that we can't answer about what was going on in Africa. There's some questions we can't answer about how the ship came to be where it was when it was. Uh, it's a Spanish ship, we think, working for a Portuguese contract. So that's not uncommon, but why that ship? So there's some questions that we can't answer there. And then the big question, the one that looms over everything, what was their legal status in Virginia? That's the big question that we don't have an answer to yet. Were they immediately treated as slaves? That would have been kind of a new concept for the English in Virginia. Uh, they have a lot of people working here under contract who are basically treated the way that we would envision a slave being treated. The system of chattel slavery that we're familiar with in this country uh, that dominated the agricultural economies of the South. There are people working here, English people, Dutch people, French, German. There are Europeans working here under similar conditions, but they signed up to do it. So maybe the conditions aren't too different. But what's their legal status? That's a question that we don't actually have an answer to. Now, I would say that evidence is starting to mount that they were treated very similarly to being enslaved right from the get-go here when they arrived in 1619, but we're still waiting for more evidence to back that up. Now, what I can say as far as the development of slavery in Virginia goes is that by 1640, 20 years later, there was a court case in Virginia where the status of a person who was trying to argue their contract with their master in a court, was told, no, you will be the same condition as your mother. What they're implying there is that the mother did not have freedom. <coughs> she did not have any kind of fixed contract period. She was going to work for the rest of her life. So that's 20 years later. Is she somebody that arrived shortly after this? Could she be one of the people in this group? We don't know. That's a question that we can't answer. And so there's a lot of this uh, there's a lot of questions that we don't have solid, good answers for yet. Uh, but what we've walked through so far, that's the stuff that's really verified. That stuff you can look up, uh, you can read those papers from Ingle Sluter and John Thornton. Both are really well done. Um, those are the topics that we understand fully. We're still trying to sort out what happened here in Virginia. That's where the big questions lie. I've been hoping that as we got closer to the summer, and we reached the 400th anniversary of this event that some of the answers might be coming out, but I think we're still a ways off from that. So we may not see answers to those questions for years to come at this point. Uh, we can only speculate. And keep that in mind as you see stuff on TV about this or you read newspaper, magazine articles. There are a lot of questions that we're still trying to answer, stuff that needs verification. So just, just keep that in mind. Now, I titled this program 20 and I. And I mentioned John Rolfe. Here's an excerpt from that letter. This is what started us down this path.
this passage from his letter going to one of the Virginia Company executives back in England. About the latter end of August, a Dutch man of war, Dutch, he knows not to call them English, that would get people in trouble. A Dutch man of war, of uh, the burden of 160 tons, arrived at Point Comfort. Point Comfort is a couple of miles from here, that's where Fort Monroe sits. So we're talking about the site where Fort Monroe is. At Point Comfort, the Commodore's name is Captain Joe. We just said it's a Dutch ship, but it has an English captain. Interesting. His pilot for the West Indies, one Mr. Marmaduke, also an Englishman. It's a Dutch ship. They met with the treasurer. All right, so he just named the other ship. We know that the treasurer is, in fact, now an English ship, not a Dutch one. We know that the White Lion is also English. So these two English ships meet up in the, the West Indies, and they determine to hold consortship hereafter. But in their passage, lost one the other. He brought not anything but twenty and odd Negroes, which the governor and Cape Merchant, that's John Rolfe, the Cape Merchant, uh, bought for victuals, for food, for supplies, so that these two ships, or this one ship, the White Lion, could sail back to England. They traded them here to get the food and water they need to make their return trip to England. This is the only thing they could think to do after they've lost their opportunity to capture a Spanish treasure galleon down in the Caribbean. So they come up here, they trade them to get the victuals they need. And the word pretend there does not have the modern connotation when they say pretend in this time period. They're just saying that's what he said. Um, so he's in great need of food, or that's what he said, uh, at the best and easiest rates they could get. They had a large and ample commission, letter of mark, from His Excellency. It doesn't even mention who His ex Excellency is. In this case, it's the stockholder of Flushing uh, Holland to take purchase in the West Indies. Three or four days after, the treasurer, the other ship, arrived. At their arrival, they're in trouble. They don't know that they're in trouble. They're about to find out. At their arrival, word was sent to the governor to know his pleasure. The new governor, not Samuel Argo, the man they expected to find. They come into port and say, we want to talk to the governor, our buddy. We want to talk to the governor. Instead, word goes to George Yardley, who does not like the treasurer or the group that they're with and request what they're supposed to do. So, myself, that's John Rolfe again, and Lieutenant Peace and Mr. Ewens, who's another merchant, go down to him and desire him to come up to James City, to Jamestown. But before we got down, they left. They found out Argyll's gone and now Yardley's going to arrest them. So they leave. They go to to Bermuda. Now, the people from that ship, another 20 or so, 20, 25, 30, we actually know that they were enslaved immediately in Bermuda, which would support the idea that that's what happened here in Virginia. Again, we can't verify this yet, but that's pretty good evidence that that may be what happened here as well. That letter from John Rolfe dated in September of 1619, a few weeks after these events transpired. So that's what brought us to this topic. And you're going to hear that term 20 and odd used quite a bit because this is the original source. This is why everybody knew that the first Africans in Virginia arrived in 1619. Everything else that we've just talked about here had to get pieced together after that. So that's what's going on. Those are the details that follow this topic that's getting so much attention this year. The arrival of the first Angolans, the first Nadongans and Matongans that came to English North America. We know where they're from, we know how they got here, we know so many details, and yet there's still so many questions that are still to be answered. So keep that in mind as you, uh, as you see other programs about this over the coming summer. All right, any questions? And if anybody would like to come up here and take a look at any of the equipment that I was showing, you're welcome to while I answer your questions, and then we're going to take a, a quick walk through the galleries. Yes? When you mention that the Portuguese established a city, do you mean a city the way we think about the civilians? Do they bring citizens? Yes. Men yes. And women and yep. Uh, every European nation looked at colonies as a <laughs> as a place to send their unwanted and extra bodies, <laughs> uh, and that was pretty common here. A lot of the early indentured servants coming to English North America were people who would otherwise have been in a prison. 
So that was pretty common for all European countries. They used the, the colonies as a place to send the surplus population, as, as, um, as uh, Charles Dickens would have called it. Uh, the surplus population goes off to the colonies and makes money for the home country. So yes, that's exactly what they so did. So it was more than just a fort. Correct. And I mean, Luanda is enormous. By 1617, they are building their third major fort. In the city, okay. uh, there's one down on the coast, and there's two further inland. And the third one is bigger than the other two put together. So I mean, they're building huge fortifications, multiple, and they've got a huge bustling city with all of this slave trade coming through and manufactured goods coming from Europe, along with agricultural products coming out of Africa. Um, there's a lot of trade going through that city, and they need a, a civilian population to support that. Yes. So, um, you mentioned that that painting at the end was done by somebody named Sidney King. Yes. Um, and uh, I'm wondering, so, and that was done in the 50s or 60s? Yes. Uh, I, I forget exactly what year, but I think it's, uh, uh, it's going to be 1957 or 58. Is it, so, is that a, is, was Sidney King a white painter? Yes. Okay. I, I'm wondering how responsible it is to use that image as the kind of, image that you're telling this story with? Well, it's one of the few interpretive images that's out there. So when we use the word interpretive in the museum world, we're talking about something that can be used to describe a situation. Um, is this what actually happened? That's speculative. I mean, if we don't, if you've been talking about how little information we have, and that particularly a lot of this information is fairly recent. Yes. It seems to me that that would be a lot of imagination that would go into that particular image, and maybe doesn't actually represent anything close to what it would look like, and maybe have a lot of kind of biases built into it. Uh, not in this case, not as far as biases go. Sidney King was very conscientious of the work that he was doing. He was working really hard to make sure that that didn't happen. He was very um, thoughtful about that point. So the series of images that he did, a lot of them were on sensitive topics like this, and I've never heard any complaints from anybody in the academic world about the way that he's portraying these things, because he was. He was thinking very carefully about that. Uh, that cannot be said for every artist. I think that it can be said for Sidney King, but there are other depictions of events that, not these particular events. I use the best images that we have already for these. Uh, but there are certainly events in American history that have been depicted in ways that are biased. Uh, but I don't think that's really going to, to be the truth with Sidney King. Now, there are some things that he gets wrong in the image. Uh, let's see if I can load this back up into full screen. Oh, come on, animations. Okay. Um, the clothing that they're wearing. Uh, in this time period, these, the clothing should have been a little bit shorter, more high-waisted. The ship in the background, these are way too big. Um, the people in the foreground, they're all wearing European shirts. That is probably not the case yet. Uh, most of them are probably wearing whatever clothing they were captured in or may have even just been naked at this point because they've, they've been wearing the clothing for a couple of years as they've been moved around Africa until they got down the coast. Uh, unless the Portuguese were giving them clothes, and we don't, we don't know. That's another thing that we can't answer. I said we have no idea what the conditions were like on these ships. We don't even know if they are giving these people clothing. Uh, we do know that every one of them was baptized as they were put on the ships. That's something we do know. Um, because the Portuguese, that was part of their mandate. They couldn't, they couldn't trade in people that weren't Christian, which seems like a weird <laughs> rule, but yeah, kind of an odd rule, but there you have it. So there are certainly some things in the image that are not accurate because he is being speculative, but as far as the bias goes, I can imagine the scene being very similar to this. You've got the English gentleman over there trying to decide how this should be handled. They've never encountered a situation like this before. Um, slavery isn't necessarily legal in Virginia. Every other person that has ever arrived here had a contract in hand that says, I'm going to work for this person for this amount of time. These are the first people that ever came here that didn't have that. So they've got to sort through all of that. And I, I think that this is a, a fair representation of that. But again, it is speculative. So it's possible that he got a lot, a lot more things wrong. There's no way for us to, you know, to really ascertain that. Um, but there are some details in there that are a little bit off. And that's just from my limited knowledge of the 17th century of Virginia. I'm by no means an expert. I'm just well versed in it. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about the 
Yes. When we, if they're all baptized, do we know their names? Were... We know some of them. Uh, that's another thing that we have partial documentation for. We know the names of about uh, half of this group. Um, and I don't have them all memorized, but two of them end up down here in, in Hampton. Uh, that's going to be Antonio and Isabella. Uh, there's going to be a woman uh, who ends up in the home of Captain Pierce uh, up in Jamestown. She's Angela. There's going to be a couple of others that we actually do have names for, but I don't, I don't have them all memorized. Yes? Did you know their native names? No, there is no record of that. Yeah, there is no record of that whatsoever. Yeah, now some of them, some of them, these may have been their actual names. Uh, Portuguese Catholicism was spreading very rapidly through that part of Africa. Uh, most, of the, uh, most of the images we have of, of that part of the world, there is a church. Anytime you see a landscape of, a, of an African city, there is a European church in the middle of that city somewhere, and you always know it because there's a cross on the top. So, I mean... Uh, Catholicism was being spread very quickly by the Portuguese, and it's not just Portuguese uh, clergy. They have Italians, they have Spaniards, they have Frenchmen. Uh, the Catholic Church didn't care where you were from. They sent you out on missions to all over the place. So some of them, this could have actually been their, their, the names that they used at home. Now, that wouldn't have been true for everybody, I'm certain, but some of them, it may have actually been the names that they were given as children. Um, but there's no way for us to sort that one out at all. Uh, none of the records that, that survived in Angola had these kinds of details in them because, uh, because Portugal lost control of Angola and it became its own country you know, 50, 60 years ago, a lot of the colonial documents no longer exist. Um, a lot of that stuff just wasn't useful anymore. Uh, same thing is true for a lot of colonial regions. Virginia, we have very little documentation. Uh, we're lucky that we know this. There's been so much conflict in this area that's destroyed documents that there's just not a whole lot of colonial records to work from. Believe it or not, as much as we know, there's a lot that's missing. So yeah, there's there's some of those things. We do know some of their names. Some of them may have actually been the names that they were given as children. We don't have any way to verify that. Um, there's a lot that we can't answer. Very good question. Anybody else? Yes? Well, this, this is the first time I've heard about the baptism. Was yes. that Portuguese, the French, the Catholic, um, as opposed to the English colony, and the English ship? Yes, and so the reason for this is different outlooks on the world. First off, uh, for the English, they, in England, the term Christian doesn't actually mean Christians, it means English or European. <laughs> so anytime you're looking at colonial records and you see the term Christian, what they're really saying is that they're European. Uh, it was illegal for the English to enslave somebody that was Christian, that was European. The exception to that being the Irish, which they do all kinds of nasty things to. Um, they're never actually enslaved as we would recognize it, but they're given some really, really rough contracts that would be close to it. Um, and they're sent over here in, in large numbers at times. But uh, for the Portuguese, this was a policy that, that affected colonial Portuguese Africa. Uh, and it was something that they did. I don't know if other European countries had the same kind of policy. I don't know that the Spanish actually cared. Um, the Spanish just need bodies. They don't care who you are, where you're from. They don't care if you can speak the same language. They can show you how to use a pickaxe and put you in the ground and dig on That's the way they look at it. They just need people that can do menial work and they burn through them. Uh, they had already decimated the native population doing that, and now they're importing these Africans because they're decimating them as well. So the Spanish, I don't think, were quite as concerned, but the Portuguese, they had rules in place about this stuff. So, and that's just that's one of those things that's kind of unique, I think, to the Portuguese. Um, I haven't read about other European countries having that kind of policy. Thank you.
probably a well. Alright. How you doing?
So we come here today, all of us, a beautiful, diverse community of people who are acknowledging this history. Okay. This is American history. This is global history. Slavery was a crime that impacted the world. So we come here today to say we remember you. We do this in honor of you every year. All across the United States and across the world, in Charleston, South Carolina, they are remembering. In Brooklyn, New York, they're remembering. In Nigeria, they're remembering. Everyone is remembering those that perish. We do this in remembrance of them. I discovered that about three All months right. ago, I decided to have my DNA test. And I discovered that my ancestors, about 89%, came from sub Saharan Africa, 36% Nigerian, 20% Ghanaian, Gambian, and Sierra Leonean, and 10% Congo. It's, this year has been typically significant to me because I realized that some 12 million Africans were transported from Africa to America, to South America, to the Caribbean area in the transatlantic slave trade. And of those 12 million, only about 350 to 400,000 came to America. And so I am particularly grateful that at least one of those ancestors was strong enough to survive that middle passage. So it's the city of Hampton, Virginia, proclamation proclaiming the second Saturday in June as the Sankofa Project's International Day of Remembrance in the city of Hampton, Virginia. Was, the Sankofa Project was established in 2012 to create educational, cultural, and social programs that explore the richness and diversity of the African diaspora. Whereas the Sankofa Project creates rituals to honor the estimated 15 million African men, women, and children who perished during the Middle Passage of the transatlantic enslavement trade, and to honor the brave souls and freedom fighters who lost their lives in the global pursuit for freedom and equality. Whereas remembrance is a communal gathering that brings awareness to this untold history around enslavement, honors the lives lost during the Middle Passage, and acknowledges the impact which, sla which slavery made on our global community. Whereas recognizing the historical significance of Virginia as the birthplace of slavery in North America, the Sankofa Project started a tradition of remembrance in the Commonwealth choosing the city of Hampton as a location for the ceremony based upon its unique position with regards to slavery and freedom. Whereas in 2012, Shadra Pickman, executive director and founder of the Sankofa Project, brought the concept and tradition of remembrance to Hampton, Virginia. Whereas 2019 marks the 400th year since the 20 and odd Africans disembarked the White Lion which officially marked the beginning of slavery in British North America. And in 2019, we remember the Clotilda, the last enslavement ship to dock in Mobile, Alabama between 1859 and 1860. And whereas for the past seven years, the Sankofa Project has orchestrated remembrance in Hampton as a part of remembrances and tributes which have occurred for 30 years across the globe. Now, therefore, I, Donnie R. Tuck, Mayor, on behalf of the City Council of the City of Hampton, Virginia, we hereby proclaim Saturday, June 8, 
2019 as the Sankofa Projects International Day of Remembrance in the city of Hampton and call upon all citizens to pay tribute to the brave men and women who lost their lives in the pursuit of freedom and equality. Furthermore, I commend the Sankofa Projects for its efforts in recognizing the many contributions our ancestors made to American society. In witness whereof, I hereunto have set my hand and caused the seal of the city of Hampton, Virginia to be affixed this 8th day of June, 2019. <laughs> One person alone doesn't make this happen. And so I want to thank you for this proclamation. I want to thank the members of Sankofa who come out every year, who've been with me since the beginning. John, Jerry, Bruce, please stand up. From day one, Amani, all of you who come out in support. All of you who come out in support, Crystal. Dimitri, Babacel, Perry, all of our sisters and brothers who come out and support this event. This would not be without you. I came to them with an idea. And I said, you know, we need to do this ceremony. They were like, bet. Let's do it. And eight years later, we're here. So thank you, Mayor Tuck, and thank you. Thank you.
while the Ivory Coast was known for Ivory, and Ghana was known for a tool, Dahomey and, and the surrounding countries of Nigeria, Togo, also Ghana, was also known as the Slave Coast. Millions of Africans were captured and forced to walk in chains for miles. They were taken down to slave room where they were made to walk around a tree. And this tree was called the tree of forgiveness. The men had to go around the tree nine times and the women seven times. The intention of this ritual was for their souls to forget and never return to heaven. They were told that this experience would make them forget everything. Their names, their families, the life they once had. After this ordeal, they were subjected to other forms of brainwashing. They were locked into a dark room, built to resemble the hall of a slave ship. After several weeks, or even months in this hell hole, the captains were back in ships for their long crossing to the Americas. This was known as the Middle Passage, but we call it the Maha, the African Holocaust. Today we are gathered here to honor those who did not make it to the shores of America. Today we will walk around our tree, which we symbolically call the Tree of Remembrance. But it just so happens that our tree was cut down. But you must always remember, you can get rid of a freedom fight, but you can't get rid of the fight for freedom. Congressman Bobby Scott come up and say a few words. I know he has another engagement and we want him to be able to address the community. And I just want to say, he's come out the last three years. I saw him at a program and I said, Congressman Scott, we need you at Buck Row. And he showed up and he has continued to show up. So for that, we say thank you. Thank you very much. Give us a round of applause. The other. You know, it was once said that those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And Chandra, with the annual Day of Remembrance, make sure that we do not forget the past. That past began right down the river about 400 years ago in August, when 20 and odd uh, slaves were there. And that history has continued for 400 years, all through slavery, up to the Civil War when slavery was abolished, and then Reconstruction, where there was a bright light. 
The African Americans elected to the General Assembly and other positions of honor all over the all over the state. And then along came Jim Crow, where all that progress was reversed. Uh, we had African Americans in Congress in the late uh, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. And then for about 30 years, not one, in fact the last one from North Carolina, promised Phoenix Lake we will return. Yes. But it was about 30 years before another African American was elected. And that progress went through all through Jim Crow, the Civil Rights Movement, the election of Barack Obama as President of the United States, and instead of zero, one, two, and three African Americans in the United States Congress, there are now 55 African Americans. All of that history and the comings and goings and the back and forth, it's important that we remember our history so that it won't be forgotten. So I want to thank everyone participating in the uh, in the International Day of Remembrance. Thank you for making sure that we remember. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Scott. And I don't have our program, but we have our sister, Ia. Where is Ia? Paul, oh, bless you. No, you keep it. You keep it. I have one. I have my sister. She's my assistant for the day. Thank you, buddy. Sister Ia, as Baba, uh, Baba Ogunjimi said, you know, the Tree of Remembrance was up for seven years, and last year I got a call. Someone said, the tree's gone. I'm like, what do you mean the tree is gone? They said it's been cut down, all the way down. And last year we decided to continue to walk around that tree because that is our tree of remembrance. It holds significance. And it means that we have not forgotten where we come from. Also what it symbolizes to me is that the tree may have been cut. Our ancestors might have been taken out of Africa, but our roots remain strong. Do they not? So you can cut a tree, it doesn't matter, we will walk around a stump. I will say this though, the city of Hampton Parks and Recs has been wonderful. I asked for a meeting with them, the representative is over here, came out, met with me, and we're in talks about doing something for that location. They even have chairs here for Dr. Christian wheelchair accessible water chair so when we go out to the beach she can go with us so for that we are grateful sister Ia I need everybody to where's Baba Ogunjami okay, we're going to have the drummers lead over to the tree sister Ia is tree? going to do Where's a prayer the at the tree right and at that Where's point right we're here? going to walk around the tree of it's remembrance like Baba Ogunjami to lead the drummers
Chanukah has stated that because this tree is gone does not mean that the dirt is not gone. In my culture, we saw we heard always, always honored no matter what. So I came here about two days ago and I had a conversation with the dirt. And I basically wanted to ask the dirt that is happening, what needs to happen, and what the dirt can do to assist us. And it said he wanted a drink, and it wants to walk. So that's what he's going to give us. All right? So we want favor. As I begin to pray in your God, don't worry about it. I'll tell you about it later. But if you can all tap your left foot at the same time, that would be lovely. You guys do that? All right.
got, man. Oh, you can handle it. Yeah, yeah, you can handle it. Yeah, that's what I mean to move the tub. Yeah.
day when we were praying for and had a ceremony Later. for Brother Hugh Harold III of the White Oak Association. He's very ill. And so today we are raising up his name and asking you all to think of him, right, send you. good thoughts, send good vibes, pray, do whatever you do, burn sage, and think of him. At that event, I saw Dr. C and she said, I'm coming to remembrance. I said, we would love to have you again. And she said she was going to speak. She wanted to speak. She spoke in 2013, and she's back in 2019 at 95, almost years of age. I don't know why you just you just I'm like coming up my camera. Hey man, you got that hair? I was respected as a man.
shit into the world. And the old judge that the floor of you might be human nature. I'm out of the I'm going to be today. I'm going to use great peace, but God's great God. I built my, I built a condo. It's so easy. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when they let me went down to the audience. And I see this funny bosom. And all of them are in the sunset. Yes, I told them this. Ancient. That's it. Rivers. My soul also has grown deep like the river. And they, as they made a copy, also go in the song. It's like about the Every voice I sing to 
code and then we're just there and we do the rest of the program. So let's do that. We're going to move Dr. P inward. We're going to move in a little bit off the circle and then people can sit down, sit in chairs, whatever you have. That's where we'll have the rest of the program. Thank you.
and I said, you know, it's really interesting. This flag represents love. It represents hate of anything. It's love of yourself. It's back to yourself. It's culture. So when we love ourselves, that's not hate. We show love. We all show love. It's in our eyes and our hair. How we are being. All of us are
Michelle, are you somewhere? Michelle, Michelle, Michelle. Where is she? Here. And I saw her. I almost cried because Michelle and I met. She worked for the city and said to me, you need to connect with the city of Hampton. You need to connect with the Hampton History Museum. You need to set us for us. So we had meetings. She connected me with them. And they became sponsors of the university. So it's a beautiful day. We have people on the inside of the house that can help you navigate these kinds of cultural programs. So I just want to say, on behalf of me and Sankofa, from my heart to yours, I appreciate you. And I thank you for everything that you have done. This, this is you too. And I thank you. Because the ancestors were important enough to her for her to say, let me hook a sister up. <laughs>
of Exodus. And
everyone to see
were African people who were enslaved, enslaved, unlocked. Just remember, you have the freedom to unlock. Yes, 
from East
No, seven. seven. So who's seven. taking the picture? Who's video? We're not. He let me do. He, he let me do a picture. Well, the girl. I love it. Oh yeah. Who's the Helen? Tell Thank me you, no cap or door. All right. Helen from the very shore. Not much has changed. Torture is violent. Change is violent. Wait, lynch. Change in man, and it's really all the same. Force is still silent. Racial profile. Stop. Trip. Unarmed killing. Red light. District witness. If black lives matter, why stand your ground? I can't breathe that Eric Garner. Hands up, don't shoot that Michael Brown. Walker Scott in his back shot. his knees by the filthy KKK. Martin Day hate crime. Put your hoodies up for Trayvon Martin. Another sign of the time. Sandra Bland's death, not the only one crossing gender lines. More than 260 others I alone could find. Mothers and grandmothers leaving their children behind. Stephen Stephon Clark in his grandmama's backyard. Twelve-year-old Tamir Rice, two seconds alone in the park. Shot and killed, both at will. And Sean Bell's knife snatched while sitting in his car. Even those with the cloak of God's protection had their lives snuffed out from the very church where they prayed, prayed and sang selections. Fill up D E S G A. Fill the death. See ya. Common, wealthy, mass murderers to nine of their very own. Move or be born. Rodney King, can't we all just get along? Oh, strange fruit hung from this commonwealth VA tree. Virginia is for lovers. It's also America's home of slavery. Antoine Sedgwick, hanging in, hanging mystery, said he hung himself with a bell. Fam, after dark, right here in the beautiful Hampton Coliseum, God Park. And another, another mother, a native of Hampton, VA, shot to her death, slumped in her car just miles away. Right here on Pembroke Avenue, Andrea Nicole Reedy, case dismissed, no jury was even needed. Africa, America, African American, sickle cell. I'm going to, I don't see, I'm going to skip that. I think that's one of those away. Yeah. Okay. African American Sickle Cell Festival at Mill Point Park on Eaton Street was even taken away. We're holding back the sky, the rain in the sky. We were not canceling for nothing, right? So we are grateful you were here. Thank you to all who participated for your time and your energy to honor these ancestors. And I just want to leave you with this. I want to leave you with this. From beloved, from Marty Wright. Over yonder, they don't want your, they don't like your neck. So love your neck. Put your hands around your neck. Hold your neck. They don't love your arms, so hold your arms. Hold your body, hug yourself, hug each other. Love yourself love another. You come from great, great people. Some survived and some didn't. But we are the dreams of our ancestors. Okay, I thank you for coming. And as I finish, I'm going to pass the mic. I want to thank the Hampton History Museum, Seamus McGrand, and everyone who always shows out and supports us. I want to thank our sound guy who made it work because it was crazy for a minute. Thank Dr. Christian and the mayor and everyone who came out today to 
to support us. The Black Panthers, the coming to the table group that came all the way from Richmond in a busload, and each and every one of you here today. If I didn't get a chance to come around and say thank you, please know my heart is thank you for being here. I'm grateful. This is our first year. Grateful. Now we're going to have the famous and fabulous Crystal Tessa lead us out. We're going to jam all the way up to the floor. But on post. Okay. We're doing a chart for So we're just changing worship. We're ready? Yeah. We're ready. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Or, or, or should I say welcome to the table? Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's right. Welcome to our table. Um, it's very exciting to have all of you shiny, happy faces with us today. Uh, my name is Ranger Anna with the National Park Service. I don't know what gave me away. But I'm very glad to see you. This is the 396th unit of the National Park System. Uh, started and established by presidential proclamation of uh, the previous president, uh, Obama, on November 1st. 2011. Uh, so we're a relatively young park. We still got that new park smell. A lot of new stuff is happening. So we're glad you can use that anytime. <laughs> so we're glad that you guys are enjoying us uh, and hope you keep coming back as we do more and more things as we go forward in the future. Uh, we are very much of a partnership operation on site. Three major landowners, one of which is working on its way out, and that is the United States Army as they continue the base closure process and get more and more of their properties turned over. Uh, they will one day, uh, the, the plan is that there will no longer be any Army presence here and that they will have turned over all of the property to the National Park Service or the Commonwealth of Virginia, which is being represented by my great friend here, uh, Miss uh, Denise Dooley. Uh, so she will help uh, for her part of that. So we, we together represent the federal government in this Commonwealth of Virginia, the state, uh, co-managing this space and that, you know, I, we own some, they own some and work together to make this happen. And a great example of this collaborative tour. Uh, I'm gonna do a little hello and she's gonna take over and then I'll pick up on the backside and fill in any holes until we get you in the bus he headed on to Harpoon Larry's. So uh, we're very glad to have you with us. And I'm not gonna say any much more just because it's time for me to turn it over to my wonderful friend, Ms. Denise. Hi everybody, so glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, we're going to kind of tag team this. I'll kind of lead you all through the museum and then Ranger Firth will take you a little bit outside and give you some more information. So hopefully we won't be too redundant in what we tell you. Uh, but we're, we're glad that you all are here. Has anyone been here before? Okay, so a couple of people. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so um, uh, now that you, the, the, for the ones that have not been here before, you'll be back. Trust me, you'll be back because it happens to everybody. Uh, once you come here, you kind of get the bug, you get bitten by the bug, and then you then people just like come back over and over again. I'm one of them, but luckily, luckily enough, I was um, was lucky enough to work here after a few years, so I'm coming. So <laughs> anyway, but uh, um, you all can can walk on this way. We'll just kind of start a little bit on the outside, and I'll just kind of tell you a little bit about the building of the fort. I'll try to be quick. Um, it's really hard for us when we get groups and then we're told, and our Convention Visitor Bureau is really bad about this, they'll say, oh, you've got, you know, barely a half an hour, maybe 20 minutes to, to, to get, and we're always like, we have over 400 years of history here, it's impo almost impossible to do it all in a half an hour. So, uh, so we're going to break it up pretty, pretty much a half an hour for myself, half an hour for, uh, for Ranger Fur, but uh, so you all can come on in here. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. 
What is a casemate? Well, you're standing in a casemate. A casemate is a room within a wall of a fort. So as you can see, and then um, ours, you'll see it better on the inside. You see this line right here. Ours are pretty much um, broken up into two, two separate rooms. And again, this will be better illustrated once we get inside. But over here, um, you can see this window. Uh, we call that an embrasure. That's where a cannon would be. So that, that's a, just a window for the cannon to stick out of. Again, it's better illustrated on the inside. Um, you see all the, uh, the bricks here and the granite that this place is made up of. Uh, just imagine all the, this, if you walk around the top of the floor, uh, it's about 1.3 miles. So if you can imagine all the stone it took and all the bricks it took to build this place, okay? The stone, of course, had to be quarried by hand and put in place by hand. Um, uh, and you can imagine just the manpower it would have taken to do all that. It actually came down from uh, the Upper Potomac in Maryland. That's where the granite came from. Of course, the bricks, the bricks all had to be made by hand, and, oh, again, put in place by hand as well. So you can imagine, I think within the first two years of this project, over 10 million bricks were, were used. Yeah, so if you can imagine just... I'm sorry? When? Uh, oh, well, it, they started building it in 1819. That's when they started building it. So it took several years, um, several years and very over budget uh, for, to the federal government by the time it was done. Could you imagine that? Federal government going over budget. <laughs> so, so we do, so these, these places are made um, very sturdy. Um, just, uh, you can see this right up here. Um, this spot right up here is basically for, well, if you're going to fire a cannon, what's it get off? Smoke. Smoke, right. So in order to, um, to alleviate the smoke, that, that's for that right there, a little smoke stack for the smoke to go out. It uh, wasn't always very successful, but um, uh, in another little part of this, interesting, interesting part of the fort, so these are, you know, they chose granite because granite is one of the strongest uh, uh, rocks that, that's available. So they used the granite, and um, another interesting thing about the fort is that you'll see right here, there's a gap right there between this outer wall and the inner walls. And that was basically to absorb the impact in case there, if there was a battle. Um, and to give you an example, so the, all things considered how these forts were built. There's a sister fort in South Carolina you may have heard of. It's called Fort Sumter. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, so Fort Sumter is actually a sister fort to Fort Monroe. Now I read an account because we all know Fort Sumter was the beginning of what? Civil War. Civil War, right. So the bombardment of Fort Sumter. I read the, an account that said during the bombardment of Fort Sumter, the men in the fort were more danger of dying from smoke inhalation than they were of the walls caving in on them. So that's how sturdy these places were built. And of course, like I said, that little smokestack right up there, you can imagine that it wouldn't be too, you know, too much. Uh, but anyways, does anyone have any questions? So as you go through, we will, we're going to go through some casemates. Um, this actually is not original flooring in here, but as we step on the first casemate, there's original herringbone uh, flooring in there, brick flooring in there, so that's sort of how it originally looked. We had, um, so there were enslaved persons, there were military convicts, and there were a bunch, a host of other people, as you can imagine, with specialties, stone masons, brick masons, um, boat captains, ox drivers. There was a whole, whole array of different people that, that had that helped build this place. And so we enslaved to make the bricks, or to make them? Yeah, yes, for the most part. There, we do know that behind us, there's... Um, try to give you a better overview of where we are right now. Um, this is where we are right now. So this is this is Fort Monroe. Okay. So you can see we are on the peninsula. We're surrounded by water. And in back, this is big body of water back here. That's Mill Creek. Um, some of the research that, that has been done, they said that there were dozens of brick kilns right along Mill Creek and they were they were helping make the bricks for this place. So yeah, yeah. So again, I'm gonna unfortunately I'm gonna have to give you somewhat of an abbreviated version because again over 400 years of history, so it's just you know. and those of us that work here and live here, we love to talk about this place, so we could talk about it for hours. <laughs> so, so come on, and you can kind of squeeze in if you can. 
All right. So, um, and again, as I said, we're, this spot has been in use for over 400 years. In the beginning, well, not the very beginning, but uh, before the colonists came in 1607, um, there was the Native American group. Was, uh, there was a Native American group here. They were under the umbrella of being under the Powhatan Federation, but this specific tribe was called the Kikitan. So, the Kikitan Indians were here when the colonists came in 1607. Um, the colonists came, they're mostly in downtown Hampton. They had, in my understanding from what I said, they had, uh, from what I saw, they had thousands of acres cleared near where downtown Hampton and Hampton New is today. So, um, so the, the colonists did come in 1607. As they were coming down, making their way towards what would become Jamestown, they did find this piece of land, like I showed you right here, uh, this little peninsula. And um, so they, they realized what a great spot it was for a number of different reasons, especially Captain John Smith, who was with them. He called it a little isle fit for a castle. Um, that's because uh, for strategic purposes, it's great, and, and defensive purposes, we're, surround, we're on a peninsula, we're surrounded by water, and we're at the confluence of three major bodies of water here. So the James River, the Chesapeake Bay, and the Atlantic Ocean. So this is a great spot to ship watch. Um, you can see if you're, any enemies are coming, see what ships are coming and going. Um, so, but as, as, as fate would have it, they went down. They had to go further, they had instructions, they had to go further inland. Because at that point in time, England was not getting along with Spain. So they were worried about the Spanish coming and attacking them. So, uh, so they, they had to go a little bit further inland according to their instructions from the Virginia Company and find some place that had a deep water harbor, preferably friendly Native Americans, and um, preferably fresh water too. That didn't work. That worked out too well for them. But, uh, but so they, they found, went on down river, they found Jamestown, they, found, they stayed there. Well, they didn't, they didn't forget about the spot that Captain Smith called Point Comfort. Okay, so they sent some men back here to Point Comfort to build a fort here. We think it looked a little bit something like this. If you all have been to Jamestown, you know, it's kind of like the triangle shape, arrowhead shape. Um, they called that Fort Algernon, okay? So Fort Algernon was here uh, for some time. You see just a little wooden palisade of fort, kind of like, like this. Uh, and... Um, so Fort, uh, Fort Algernon eventually was used sort of as a customs house. And what that was, was that they, they would use it, um, if ships were coming in, they wanted to do some business in Jamestown, they would kind of check in here first with, uh, with the fort. So um, just to make sure that they weren't you know, going to be stirring up any trouble or they weren't you know, enemy ships or anything. So um, some, other, some things happened when Fort Algernon was here, especially around 1619. There was a few things that happened in the, in the, the colony at the time. So of course we had the first governmental body been at Jamestown. We had what they, they think the first Thanksgiving happened at Berkeley Plantation outside of Jamestown. Um, and then they, uh, the England at that point started actively recruiting women. So we think the first ship that carried a lot of women during that from that recruitment phase came and checked in here as well. One of the more important things that happened here, more importantly, was in 1619 a ship called the White Lion came. And they were had they had some um, some men and women on there from Angola. So we had the first people of African descent come here um, to the colony of Virginia, would become the colony of Virginia. So um, and then they checked in here, and then we're not really sure what happened after that. Uh, scholars, there's some questions. Scholars have questions, but uh, but anyway. But now, 16, 2019, we are commemorating these events uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia here at Fort Monroe. We are having, we're opening a visitor center and um, right over across the way, we're, we're opening a new visitor center. So we're gonna tell a lot about that story. So, does anyone have any questions? Okay, move on. So we, um, eventually Fort Algernon burned down. We think they did build a more substantial fort here at Point Comfort called Fort George. And that was brick. And that was in the early 1700s, but they think it washed away in a hurricane. So eventually that was gone. And that left this whole area, what we call Hampton Roads today, kind of left Hampton Roads undefended for the longest time. So as we know, um, uh, the Revolutionary War came. Okay, there were no defenses here, but this spot was used. Uh, during the Revolutionary War by the French Navy because we have a deep water harbor here. Originally, um, General Cornwallis was given orders to come here to Point Comfort, but for some reason he didn't think this was a good spot. So as fate would have it, he went on down to, to Yorktown. 
So, but um, but the French Navy didn't realize what a good spot this was. They used it as a staging ground for the Battle of Yorktown. Um, so, uh, anyway, so the spot was used then. But uh, even after the Revolutionary War, um, things kind of went on as they were. Still, there was no defenses here until the War of 1812. So uh, the British didn't learn their, their lesson the first time, so they came back again. Well, um, they, uh, they, there was a little battle. I don't know if you all in Richmond are familiar with the Battle of Craney Island. Yeah, so the Battle of Craney Island was right across the way. And um, the, the, uh, much to their chagrin, the British were beat by the Americans at that time. So they um, were not very happy, as you can imagine. And then they came over here to Point Comfort. And, and this was their gateway to go into the, the town of Hampton and then burn and pillage Hampton. So they kind of took out their anger on, on Hampton. Meanwhile, being here, uh, they did use Point Comfort sort of as a lookout area. And we do have uh, a very old, our oldest structure here at Point Comfort is our Point Comfort Lighthouse, old Point Comfort Lighthouse today. And um, so that was standing during the War of 1812. It was built about 1802. And the British did use that as a lookout during the War of 1812. Again, we're at, at the confluence of those three bodies of water. They can look out and monitor ship traffic. So, um, so again, we were, did kind of have a part in the War of 1812 as well. But bottom line, War of 1812 was a wake-up call for the federal government. Okay, um, they, had, they, had, they knew the coastal defenses needed some help, even as back was when Thomas Jefferson was in office as well. But, uh, you know, the government's always, you know, we can't afford it, that kind of thing. So they kind of put it on the back burner for a while until the War of 1812. So once the War of 1812 came around, um, came and went anyway, they, they started building a bunch of forts, and um, we call it the third system of forts. Not that that really means much, but third system of forts, and they, they built about 42 of them. And I already mentioned a sister fort to you, um, Fort Sumter, right, in uh, South Carolina. Fort Pulaski, Georgia is another one. There's some dry tortugas in Florida. In around the Gulf Coast, I think Fort Delaware might be one. And um, even up on the West Coast as well, Fort Alcatraz. You may have heard of Fort Alcatraz. So, um, so these are all, like, there was about 42 in all, as I said. And uh, so this was a new wave of coastal defenses when they were built. Y'all have any questions? And as I, you can see, in this case, mate, it, um, it shows you, as I was trying to illustrate in the back, so how we had the two rooms, our casemates in the two rooms, that's what we call the gun room, this is called the crew room. When they weren't practicing firing the gun, they, the crew would just kind of hang out in this room. Um, all the casemates pretty much had fireplaces in them as well. So, um, we have these archways here. And so every archway, of course, you know, the Roman principle of arches, right? So, an architecture. So for every arch you have above your head, you have a counter arch underneath you as well. And that's pretty much because we have to have passageways. So, but that would in turn create voids. And if you create voids, it's going to be a weakness in the structure. So the counter arch underneath helped to strengthen that. Um, a lot of people, I mentioned Lieutenant, um, Lieutenant Robert E. Lee, I mentioned his name. He was here in the 1830s, he was an engineer, he's a West Point graduate. Um, so he was here in the 1830s working on the moat, working on, and working on ramparts as well, on the walls. Um, you'll maybe, Josie Johnson, you might recognize his name as well in, in regards to the Civil War. Um, so you recognize these names in regard to the Civil War, and some people might say, well, why is Robert E. Lee here? He was a Confederate general. He wasn't always a Confederate general. Again, he was second lieutenant in the U.S. military. He was a West Pointer, as were most of the, um, most of the generals in the Civil War, North and South. So they all knew each other, even though they ended up fighting against each other. So even so, they would have passed through these walls here at Fort Monroe. Um, and uh, it, eventually, in 1832, this gentleman right here, Chief Blackhawk, it was the end of the Blackhawk Wars, and Chief Blackhawk was captured, and he was given into the care of a man named uh, Lieutenant Jefferson Davis, ironically enough. 
Chief Blackhawk was, uh, he was in Lieutenant Davis's care for a while until he was handed over to troops to be brought here to Fort Monroe. Uh, and we did use, we used to have a pipe that Chief Blackhawk had given Lieutenant Davis because he was his, his kindness and caring for him before he was handed over. Now Chief Blackhawk, when he was here, he was not here for very long, but he was, he was treated sort of like a celebrity. Um, his, 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 um, his uh, battlefield prowess, uh, you know, kind of, uh, he had that reputation, so people kind of knew about him, and they wouldn't see him in person and stuff, so he was kind of a celebrity while I was here. I know he was taken to Richmond to have his portrait taken as well, so, um, but again, he was not here for very long before he was let go. Um, so what had, had, so he went to West Point after he left here. So, uh, so anyway, and of course he established himself more as a writer, uh, you know, after he left West Point even. But Poe like, did like it here, he came back at some point, at one point he was going to have a speaking engagement in Norfolk. Well, he stopped here on his way, and he went to the Hygieia. So there were some people there with him, and they asked him to do a recitation of some of his poetry and short stories at, on the veranda of the Hygieia. So he did, he obliged. Um, and then a couple weeks later, he was dead on the street there in Baltimore. So, yeah, so he did come here after he actually got out. So. All right, so we have, um, after Poe was here even, well, the first mission of Fort Row was for artillery school. Okay. So, and that was, we have uh, Abraham Eustace. He was, um, he was uh, commandant, I think, here. And well, Fenwick was originally the, the first commandant. But Eustace was here too. And of course, Fort Eustace named after him as well. So that was the focus of, of Fort Monroe was artillery school, of course, up until the Civil War. So we've come over here. Uh, picture. So during the Civil War, of course, the Civil War came and, and Fort Monroe, we only had a couple, two or three hundred soldiers, I believe, here. As you can imagine, with the outbreak of the Civil War, that's just like expounded tremendously. We ended up having thousands here. Um, so Fort Monroe was called the key to, called the, key to the South, and um, there's a reason for that, because here we are, we're a Union fort in the South, of course, down the road, down the road from Richmond, the capital, the Confederate capital. So this was a really important spot. And um, interestingly enough, during the war, Fort Monroe was never challenged by the Confederates. Hmm. It was never challenged. People have their, their people, some people think that, well, maybe because, like I said, all the, you know, the other generals, even all the Perfect. veterans were here, had been here, maybe they knew how solid this place was built. And I don't really know, but if that's the case, but, but yeah, so they never, interestingly enough, they never challenged it, but one, some of the major battles were, there's the kind of stage out of here and planned out of here as well. So, okay. And he was a very colorful character. Um, if you know anything about Civil War history, he's probably number two on the list behind General Sherman, to not mention the South. So he was quite a colorful character. So we'll talk about him in a minute. But he was a lawyer and a politician from Massachusetts. And um, you can see this picture right here. They call him, they used to call him the Beast. I know they called him the Spoons Butler. And, and he got a reputation in, in New Orleans, is what happened. So a bad reputation. But uh, General Butler, of course, like I said, he was a lawyer and a politician, and uh, so he had some money, and this actually is his mess chest. He had, uh, this was made by Tiffany and Company in New York. Wow. So, yes. And it's, it's stamped, it's really neat because on the back of the plates, you know, it has a Tiffany stamp on it, and then it's got Butler engraved on the back. So it's wow. really, really neat, yeah. That's so, of course, for the weird, the, you know, the glasses are, are, are cracked, but, but it's pretty neat. I got you too. <laughs> yep. For the Union, um, so they realized they had a lot of work to do once that once that broke out. Row, but what's the what we call the Battle of Hampton Roads today? So a lot of people call it the Battle of the Monitor of Merrimack, which is kind of half true. Um, it was the Battle of the Monitor. Here's a, uh, a model of the Monitor right here. But it was actually it wasn't the Merrimack. It was a CSS Virginia. Uh, it used to be called the Merrimack uh, when it was over at Gosport Navy Yard, which is our oldest dry dock in the country, right over there in Portsmouth, okay? And um, so when the beginning of the war broke out, the, the Union realized they better, they better abandon Gosport Navy Yard. So what they did, they had the Merrimack, they scuttled it, they burned it down to the waterline in hopes that the, the, the Confederates would not get their hands on it. But of course they came in, they took the Navy Yard, and they did. So they raised it, and then this is what it looked like. So this is the CSS Virginia. Um, we like to talk about, here in this area, we love to talk about the Battle of Hampton Roads. Um, 
it was revolutionary in that it was the, the, um, the it was new technology. Naval warfare up until that time consisted of wooden ships firing at each other, firing red hot cannonballs at each other. That's what they would do. And of course, if you fire a red hot cannonball cannonball at a wooden ship, what's going to happen? It's going to catch on fire. You'll put a, a hole in it, right? You probably sink it. It'll take on water. So, um, so once these what we call the ironclads came around, it was totally new technology. So you can see the Virginia not only was it clad in iron, it had sloping sides. If you're going to fire a hot shot at it, it's not going to burn it, and then the sloping sides of cannonballs is going to go down, slide into the water. So of course the monitor was really, really new technology because it really looked like. Whatever, a cheese box on a raft is what they call it. Um, and so, of course, you can see it's iron, but then if you were going to shoot at it, it sat so low in the, wa in the water that most likely the cannonballs were going to go over top of it. So you wouldn't really make much contact. But So at any rate, um, the Battle of Hampton Roads happened right out here off of Newport News Point. And the soldiers that were here at the time, they could stand up the ramparts and they could see it happen. In my understanding, we do fire a volley or two at the CSS Virginia. I don't know if it made contact or anything, uh, but just mainly to harass it. So, um, so that's the big thing that happened out there. The, the, um, we know that the Cumberland and I think the Minnesota, the Cumberland was sank. I don't remember the Minnesota, but um, but that's that's pretty much happened. But between the battle between these two monitors or the the uh, ironclads was actually a draw. No one actually won. So, um, and, but again, like I said, the importance of this battle was the fact that it was new technology coming together and it just kind of totally changed the world of success. All right. Um, General Butler was here at the beginning of the war, and um, so he had so within days of him coming here to be the commanding general, there were three enslaved men that had escaped, and they got here to the gate, the main gate, as I was saying, to Fort Monroe. And up until that time, others had tried to come here to gain their freedom. But there was this little thing called the Fugitive Slave Law, which prevented them, they, which meant that they had to be turned away each time. So, um, so this was, this was uh, pretty interesting that these three men got up the courage to come here and try to get their freedom. And not only did they make it to the gate, they, um, without getting caught, so, and then they made it to the gate and they actually got an audience. Like, if you ever come in and get an audience with, with, with General Butler. And um, so General Butler listens to their story, basically. And I'm being brief because we are, our time is very brief right now. Um, but, but so General Butler gave them an audience and he listened to their stories and he basically slept on it. And uh, the next day, a representative for, um, for the, the man that owned um, Baker Townsend and Mallory, he came and he said, okay, I'm ready to take these guys back. Just give them to me. I know they came here. Just give them to me and we'll be done. And General Baker, or General Butler rather said, no, 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 no. He said, you were trying to use these men because he was. They were using them against the Union forces. They were making them work on um, gun emplacements and things like that and, and um, uh, earthworks, basically. And he said, you were using these men against the United States. So, therefore, we're considering them contraband of war. And he was kind of just, you know, beating them at their own game at that point, is what it was. So, um, so he sent them on his way. And the interesting thing about this story is that within days, there was like 10 people coming, 20 people coming. There. I mean, it was really in the days before cell phones, it was just incredible that there was this grapevine and people just knew to come here. Um, now, when they came here, did they get their freedom? Not really. I mean, it was sort of like a limbo kind of thing, you know. So they weren't, they weren't, they were no longer slaves, but they were no longer free. Uh, most of the men ended up doing work for the for the U.S. Army and uh, things like that. And the women, the women and children. Well, the women mainly would do, of course, like laundressing and you know, cooking that kind of thing. But but the men were put to work and given a salary by um, and rations by the U.S. military. So, um, but the interesting thing about this is this was created a. a um, an opportunity for education. So what happened was that we had, we did, there was a woman in the area and she was a teacher and she was one of the first teachers of, of the some of the consequences, Ms. Mary, Ms. Mary P. And there's this really neat, uh, beautiful oak tree and that's a picture of it right there, sort of a painting. You can see it right there. What we call the Emancipation Oak on the grounds of Hampton University. So... Is that in front of the library? 
Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. where you came yeah. from? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So Miss Peek would teach him. Unfortunately, she died very young, so she was only able to do that for uh, a few months. But but she was the the catalyst for um, for education. And of course, as we know, that kind of morphed into the um, the the normal. Uh, I can't. I can't remember the the normal. Yeah. Normal Institute, um, and yeah, so which today is Hampton University. So of course we call it the Emancipation Oak because also that's where the Emancipation Proclamation was first read as well. So um, some great stories come out of that as well. Some of the contrabands that were here. Um, this man, this gentleman right here, James Apostle Fields, and his brother, George Washington Fields. It's just an amazing, amazing story for this family. He and his... Uh, they, he and his parents, his parents had, I think, maybe 11 children, maybe one died in infancy, and before they, they end up escaping here to Fort Monroe. Uh, the mother escaped first with five of, the, five of the children. Three of the other children had already been sold off to another plantation, um, and then James Apostle was on his own. So the mother came here with the five children, and the father was on another plantation. So the amazing part about the story is, um, after the war, um, the mother was already here with the five children. James Apostle came not too long after that. I think George Washington was one of the five children. After the war was over, amazingly, the three other siblings that had been on other plantations found their way here, and then the father got, came here as well, so they were all reunited. So just and, and these two gentlemen became lawyers, and they were in the, I believe they were um, state reps in the General Assembly as well. So they both stayed, and I know um, George Washington stayed in Hampton, and James Apostle, he has a house in uh, Newport News as well. His house is still there as a historic site. So, yeah, so some amazing stories have come out. Uh, as that. an actress in Richmond, they plays the role of the, of the mother. Oh, yes, 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 Martha Ann Fields. Yeah. Exactly, yes. And she's, she has been here as well. Yeah, she's been here um, to do programs. Like, I think maybe even at the Cape Park House as well. So, yeah. So, um, anyway, so based on all that, you know, so in 2011, President Obama did make this a national monument. So, based on our art of freedom and um, especially with the copyright decision. So, it was sort of, sort of maybe the, um, the beginning of slavery and the end of slavery as well. So, yeah. Okay, and he was caught with some of his cabinet members in Georgia. So he was fleeing in Georgia. And he was brought here to be in prison. So this is his cell. This is where he was when he was still in prison here. So you can take a look in there and notice the, uh, and then look 